Welcome everybody to an interview with an angel investor. This is part of our founder success stories, but from a different angle in terms of, I have a very successful founder here with me today, as well as an investor who makes other founders successful. So I wanted to bring Janisa on because, well, I'm pretty sure she's way smarter than me in these things. And then also to have an angel investor share many of the things that we advisors share, but are just going to come across different. And you're just going to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, if you will, to use that phrase. As you can see, Janice is nowhere near a horse whatsoever. However, uh, in terms of, I've done some angel investing, and although I work with funds, et cetera, sometimes it's just great to get a different perspective than having your advisor tell you, this is what you need, et cetera. Hearing it from an investor rings differently. And I know this just to be a fact. And so I'm hoping that we can really unpack what it means to go out and raise a seed round. I'd like to clarify that this is different than a pre-seed round. A pre-seed round, just to define for those of you who might be in this spot, is a round to help you pretty much build your product, get you going. And a pre-seed round would involve friends, family, and associates type investment. You wouldn't go to a professional angel investor like Janisa for a pre-seed round. We're gonna be talking about seed rounds. So again, I just want to say I'm super excited. Thank you, Janisa, for joining us. Janisa, share with us your background and give us a little context. Who are you and what's made you so smart when it comes to this startup and what made you an angel investor as well? Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Janisa Hollingshead. I have a background in tech and startups. I'm, I started out actually at startups.com. Back when it first started, I was helping entrepreneurs get investments for their businesses. I moved on, did a couple of other things, I'm, but my, my, most of my career was spent with Uber, launching products for them and then running them. So I, back in 2015, I'm, I started on the rides business, launching Lexington, Louisville, uh, Bowling Green, worked on Cincinnati, came down to Brazil and helped launch uh, some markets here, Brasilia, Goiania and then went back to the States and moved over to Uber Eats, planned those launches uh, pretty much everywhere from Nebraska to Ohio. And then I moved on to Uber Works where I was the head of expansion and local operations, grew that business from zero to about 100,000 users within roughly a year, year and a half, a uh, variable contribution margin positive. Um, so we were making some money there. I, and then after that, I, I left Uber during COVID and moved on to starting my own business. I'm, since then, I have started a couple of businesses, started angel investing. I'm a limited partner with One Way Ventures. I'm, I've gone through the On Deck Angels Fellowship. So I do a few different things. Okay. And so not only do you have experience as a founder, but you have experience working inside a startup like Uber which is, you know, I think that we need to identify and acknowledge because Uber was notorious for losing money year after year after year, and you ran a division that actually made money. I think that's a big deal, right? And to go from zero to 100,000 users in the time that you did. So you have experience working in large startups, but you're also networked with other investors. You've been trained You've gone through the education to become an angel investor, and then you're also continually doing your own thing as a founder. So you have a pretty holistic, well-rounded portfolio of experience. Yeah, definitely. I'd consider myself a, an operator angel. So the kind of person who was very into startups, very into the operations there, and then took that expertise and I apply it to my investments as an angel. Fantastic. Let's point that out. Let's really highlight this because if anybody's going to be friendly to a founder, it's going to be you because you know what it's like to sit on, on that side of the table. And so I'm sure you have a huge level of empathy and you're not this sort of 
type where you're going to ha ha ha, you know, I've got all the money, I'm going to have all the power, make you jump through hoops and what have you. So what's it been like for you in terms of the moving into angel investing with founders? Uh, it's been exciting, also scary to do it for the first time because I, you know, most of your investments probably aren't going to return much. And so taking that dive into that pool, being on the other side, it made me nervous. Um, but I think it's great to be able to give back to founders and to contribute in a really significant way uh, to their growth and to, to helping them unlock future growth through funding. Which is the true definition of an angel investor to come mm -hmm. in and be this angelic being to, <laughs> to just float in and miraculously help with the funding process. I love it. So how about we just take a quick look at the portfolio. As I was looking through the portfolio of investments you've made, I was really impressed. How about we just take a look and you can kind of give me the lowdown. Sure. All right. So first we've got Bolt. What's the story behind Bolt? So with Bolt, um, I think this was actually one of my first investments. Um, it came through a recommendation from somebody that I had worked with previously at Uber. Um, so I was interested immediately because this person was very trustworthy. Um, I really respected them and their opinion. And so I took a look and I, Bolt met several of the, the criteria that I look for when I'm investing. Um, so they look professional, first of all, like this is a nice looking website. You can tell they put work into it. Um, they're experts with marketing, UX and UI. Um, they also had just great growth, like incredible growth. And that's something that I look for as well. I don't want, um, you know, two, 5% year over year, month over growth. I I'm looking for investment opportunities that, that have huge growth, like, you know, 50%, hundred percent year over year is, is really what I'm looking for. Um, and then secondly, it's just an interesting product. Um, I, I, it's a tech thing. I'm, that's my background. And so I felt like I was more able to understand their, their details around what they were asking for with the investment and how they were doing. And so it made me much more comfortable uh, making this investment. Okay, great. And this was a seed round that you did. You got in that seed. Um, let me check real quick. One second. I think it was a later round. It was a later round. One. Okay. Yeah. It was. Do, do, do. Bolt. This one was. Sorry, I'm clicking through my AngelList profile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was a later round. It was yeah. a later round. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, Brymore or Bremore? How do you pronounce this? I think it's Brian Moore. Brian Moore. Uh, yep. Okay. So enabling local production by providing merging brands with nationwide coverage through a network of individual distributors. All right. So then I'm going to point out the difference. So checkout OS is one click checkout for everyone, pretty much mm -hmm. in the e-commerce space. And then here, tell us about Brian Moore. Yeah. So this one was interesting to me because it is a network. It's a marketplace. And I spent you know, the bulk of my career working on marketplace businesses. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm familiar um, with how marketplaces work. I was able to, to really understand um, the, the metrics that they were putting forth um, for investors to take a look at. Um, and this one also came recommended to me. This is something that, I, you know, as we go through each of these, you're going to see they, they were each recommended by someone that I trusted mm -hmm. and that made a big difference. That's what made them stand out. It's what made me take a look at them and, and ultimately invest. Um, Brian Moore specifically uh, also has had just incredible growth. Um, just absolutely like off the charts growth. Um, and so that you can see it here um, it, on the first paragraph on the screen. Uh, it says, you know, they saw 400 X growth in revenue and the number of sellers and suppliers. That's something like, you got to get in on, right? Sure. And then um, they also work with emerging markets here. Um, and that is something I was interested in learning more about and getting into. And so investing was a way to do that. Okay. I want to point out something that Janice had just said, and this is where traction trumps everything. You show the growth and investors got to get it. That's the name of the game. And that's the secret. And again, this is, remember, this is seed rounds, seed and later stages. So what, what stage was Brymore? 
Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to share this, but it was okay. Just past scene. Okay. Um, okay. Say, say no more. Say no more. <laughs> and then here we got Elroy Air, mm -hmm. and it enables same day shipping to every person on the planet. How cool is that? Yeah. Like, very cool. <laughs> like that's amazing. So um, again, this one came recommended to me from someone I trusted. Um, it's also like this has a wow factor to it. You know, um, so Uber at one point was getting into um, into drone delivery, Uber Elevate. Um, they did shut that down during COVID, but it's something that I, I've seen a little bit behind the scenes and I'm familiar with um, the potential here. And it's it's cool. Like this one made me feel cool to invest in. <laughs> like, you know, like that's something I want to brag about to my friends. Like, oh yeah, like Elroy Air. Also Bolt, um, you know, you, you check out somewhere and you might see them. And I'm with friends, I'm like, oh yeah, I invested in the company that did this. That's cool, right? You get a little bit of social status from that. Sure. Fabulous. Totally dig it. And then let's take a look. Okay. And here's another different one, right? Eight, yep. This one, I am it again, came recommended to me. I am it. This one is not typically what I would invest in, right? It's it's an item, it's it's physical, it's mattresses and you yeah know, cpg peppers. yeah um so it, it doesn't super fit into like what i'm familiar with um from my background or the other things that i have invested in but i mean you can see here the awards um it has you know a wow factor in a different way they've done well they have traction um they had really good growth their marketing is super professional uh it looks well done um, after I was looking at their website, you know, deciding whether or not to invest, I started getting their ads that they're on top of it with marketing. Sure. The ads look nice. I was like, people will probably buy this based on my own experience as a marketer. I was like, this is well done. Um, and I believe that they will be able to succeed. Okay. So I got a question for you. Let's, let's talk about the difference between say tech software and CPG consumer packaged goods. What's the difference and how do you take a look? And generally speaking, what I explain is it's a lot harder to raise investment as a startup founder in CPG, as well as direct to consumer, anything in terms of just selling things, you know, having to deliver stuff. And you'll see a lot of angel investors or early stage funds say we invest in everything except you know consumer brands and anything d to c type thing what's the reason for that and then kind of parlay that into the reason you did take a chance and okay. invest in eight sleep yeah um so with tech is SaaS that kind of thing i'm they need money to get started and to get the tech built. There's a large upfront hurdle there to get to your MVP or to a working version of what you've got. And then it's really about user acquisition and growth, right? And you can turn on the growth faucet so you can, you can put more money in to grow faster, but it's not as expensive as CPG wherein there's, there's a larger fixed cost and that fixed cost is ongoing because of the cost of goods sold, right? And then you also have to do the marketing on top of it. So I think there's a little bit more risk there, at least from the way that I'm looking at it, um, because they do have more ongoing costs than CPG. Um, you also run into risks uh, around supply chain. I think a lot of people have heard about that or seen that, experienced it in some way over the last couple of years. Um, if, if a CPG brand can't get some component of what they're making um, or packaging or whatever it may be, they're disrupted, they can't fulfill orders, their customers get mad, it might start a vicious cycle there, right? And so that um, that's why I invest more on the tech side um, than in CPG. But this one, I'm, the reason why I did it was because it looked cool, it looked like it was good marketing. I'm, the team was really solid as well, the people who started this, that makes a big difference when the founders have some kind of past experience. I'm, that leads you to believe that they're going to be able to pull something off again. Um, there were other investors um, that were in the round that I invested in that gave me confidence. They, the, those investors are um, smarter than I am, I would say with this, much more experienced. And so I was like, all right, if, if they're going to do this, I'll take a risk on this. I want to diversify my portfolio a little bit and I'll try it out. 
what I heard was it's all about risk. So if the founder and the startup can de-risk the investment, because in the investor's mind, you're going through all the risks, mm -hmm. supply chain with consumer brands, competition, other you know entries into the marketplace, marketing can be hit or miss depending like in there has to be that wow factor differentiation the team de-risks everything so it's up to the founder and the startup to de-risk the investment opportunity as much as possible and what i heard was this sleep mattress company even though it wasn't right up your vein they de-risked it enough for you including social proof as social validation, peer support, other investors coming in, that did it for you, you became an investor. Yes, they also, um, they did have a tech component or they do have a tech component to what they're offering. Uh, and so that also helped through to reduce the risk a little bit. I'm like, okay, the way they're making revenue is not just on the mattress. They're making money in other ways. They're engaging their customers in other ways, so. Absolutely, and I would say that would be a major component to even get in front of a professional angel or a fund. If you're just, if you just created a really cool gizmo widget, a better mousetrap, you're better served. Again, pre-seed, go. And there are a lot of investors that will invest in hard goods company, durables, non-durables, food, et cetera. And they'll just seek a return like a small business investor would, everybody does that. But when we're talking about startups, investors are looking for that 10X, is this gonna 10X? Is this gonna unicorn, decacorn, whatever, hexacorn, I don't, you know, whatever you do. What is it for you? Like when you're looking at it and you're thinking the types of return, are you thinking like, this has gotta go 10X type thing? like? walk us through what goes through your mind in terms of evaluating that upside, the asymmetric upside that startups represent. Yeah. So um, I, I know that with most of my investments, uh, I'm probably not going to get anything back, maybe a little bit. Uh, and so I need at, at least some of them to hit right with like a 10 X return or more. Uh, I know it, it will take some time years for this to happen. Um, and, but what I need to do when I'm considering new investments is to hedge my risk. Like you're saying, I need to say, okay, do they have um, a large potential market that they can you know, sell to? Do they have a way to diversify what they're offering? Um, how do they compare to the competitors? Do I, do, are they innovating or are they a dinosaur? Are they moving slowly? Does the team seem organized? Does it seem like they understand the space and they have prior success and they're going to be able to pivot quickly because over the course of many years, you know, five, seven, 10 years while I'm waiting on a return for these things, um, they're going to have to pivot. I, I, I know that. And if, if I don't think that they're flexible enough um, and experienced enough to do that, then I don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to make it past the pivot point and that I'm going to get anything back on my investment. Okay. And we're going to talk about this in a moment, but you're going to hear this all the time. Invest in teams and founders, not ideas. And for that very reason, knowing that there is most likely some sort of pivoting that's going to occur, at least iteration, strategic iteration the team's going to have to. I'm going to bring that up in a moment. Let's take a look at the last one here. It looks like another marketplace. Yes. So what's the story behind Orchard? Um, so they are uh, a real estate marketplace essentially, or a platform. They um, they work with brokerages, title and uh, mortgages, insurance brokerages, that kind of thing. Um, they provide instant equity um, to homeowners so that they can buy their next home before they um, sell the other home, essentially, right? It says it right there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that solves a really acute pain point, I think, for people who are, who are trying to buy a new home and sell their existing home. Um, I've met many people who have tried to do this um, and they end up having to stay in an apartment that is more than what their mortgage is going to be in between or they it's hard to like line up with you know where they're going to live that kind of thing so I'm familiar with the problem here um, and this seems like a one of those solutions where if people start using this they will never go back to how they did it before 
right? And so that's definitely something that I, I look for in investments as well. Like, is this like a, oh, duh, of course this is the solution type of thing. So that when people use it, they're not going to say, oh, this is cool, but I'm just going to do it the other way next time. You know, they've, they've got that stickiness. Sure. So then let's talk about it. I, so I tell founders all the time, investors are looking for, are you solving a problem that's painful enough that a lot of people have and you and will continue to have? This is an ongoing market and it's sticky, if you will, but also are you providing a, like the more novel and unique of an insight to the point where the investor goes, huh, that just totally makes sense. That's common sense. And it's such a unique way of filling that problem. And you're actually teaching the investor something different. Like, yeah, everybody's got that problem. That's, that's a major issue, but yeah, you're figuring it out. This is really interesting. The better chance you have of getting their investment. How did I do? How does that work for you? Um, say that again. How does it work in terms of? Like in terms of when you're trying to evaluate a unique insight or those investments that you said, oh, this is really unique and novel. Yeah. So I Google. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Literally, like if it's, um, if, if it's, you know, something that seems cool, like a, like a no brainer type of solution, I'll, I'll do some Google research. I'll spend a few hours trying to see what are their competitors? What are their competitors doing? How are they different? How, where are they not different? Um, where is this investment opportunity really focusing on their marketing and their messaging? Um, what are people saying about them online? Um, what are they saying about the competitors? That kind of thing, right? I, I'm just, I'm looking to see like, is this actually unique? Yeah. And if it is unique um, in one aspect, is it something that people are talking about? Because some startups, they think that they're unique in one way and they're like, this is the differentiator, but people actually don't care about the differentiator. That's not a huge pain point for them. And so I wanna see that. Mm, really great. So again, for everybody, everybody who's gonna be watching this, this is the reason we make you research your com competitors <laughs> really well. Because if, you're, if you don't have a, an insight into your competitors and understand how you're different and you know something that they don't know and the investor can find that and not you, well, that's just going to be a bad look. <laughs> you're going to lose it right away. So research your competitors. I'd like to talk about this whole referral thing, okay? Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's let's break it down in a, in a two buckets. First is... We know referrals are king from referrals from founders who have gotten investment from an investor, but then also other investors saying, hey, you got to get in on this, et cetera. I have investors contact me all the time, say, hey, what are you looking at? What have you gotten into, et cetera? Because it's part of de-risking if we all know that we're working together on this. So how would you advise a founder to get a referral? To get a referral. So one, this is a difficult question. <laughs> so uh, if you can break the goose egg, obviously, and get somebody to invest, uh, you want that first person to be someone who is well-connected and who is in, you know, different investing groups, or they have um, former colleagues or friends or family or something like that, that they are, they're going to refer you to. And if you are the first investor, you want other investors to to come in and join you on a round if you're, you know, really looking for the success of the business. Um, so, I mean, that's a simple answer, but it's not as simple as just going and getting a really well-connected first investor, right? Um, other ways that I've seen people do this is uh, they will basically reach out to people and ask how they can be helpful. They do something for the person, make themselves valuable, and then they ask for the referral. Wow. Um, that's one way I've seen um, other ways. I, if they can provide, so I've, I've made referrals for people before, if they can provide me essentially with what they want me to say and exactly who they want the referral to. Um, I, I get a bunch of these requests, like all the time, probably 20 requests for funding a day um, on LinkedIn. Some of them are very bad, like copy and paste and they get the name wrong. 
Um, so <laughs> some of them are fine. They're just like very standard. Like here's this thing. They haven't put a lot of research into it. Some people reach out and they say, hey, I see you're connected to this person and you worked with them at Uber and I know that they invest in XYZ. Um, here is you know, why I think they would care about this. Bullet, bullet, bullet with um, metrics, KPIs, like, you know, we've experienced this growth and we've put this much of our own money into it and we're looking for money, this much money for whatever the next goal is, right? Um, can you give us an intro, please? That one, I'll probably read and, and I may take action on. Okay, let's talk about this. Let's unpack this okay. because we can yeah. do this on LinkedIn. We can go and find and connect uh, people all the time through LinkedIn and say, you know, we have mutual connections, et cetera. No problem, easy on that. But let's be frank here, Janisa, that's, you're using a lot of social capital to make that referral. I'm not, I'm not just making referral off someone who contacts me on LinkedIn and a lot of founders come to me, do you know anyone, you know, et cetera. And if they haven't really built up some social capital with me, I'm not going to go into debt. I'll just be straightforward because I don't know when I'm going to need that connection. And I don't need my close friends who trust me. And I've got a reputation of integrity. And I've spent a long time. You can spend 50 years building up a reputation and, you know, cutting it down in a matter of five minutes. So um, what do you need to see before you start spending that social capital? That is a great question because I totally agree with you, right? Like I'm not, I, my name is everything to me in business and in investing. Um, I've spent years building up my credibility and I don't want to ruin it. Um, and so I think people who do their research um, and who like clearly have taken the time to customize their outreach and it's relevant and all that, that shows that they are trying, right? At least that's, yeah, that gets it started. Um, if they can show traction, um, that's really, really important. If, if they can say, if they say, Hey, I've got this idea and I have five users, I'm probably not going to use my social capital for that kind of thing. Right. Um, if they say, Hey, I started this thing, I have put $20,000 of my own money into it. Um, that shows one, they've got skin in the game. And then they say, and over the last six months we've had, uh, Sorry, okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear. Me yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's wait for it to pass. That's Rio for you. There's a lot of them. Um, okay, so I, if they can say, I put, you know, I've got skin in the game. I put my own money into this, and over the past six months, we've had a hundred percent growth in our customers, and we now have. You know, we went from 5,000 to 10,000. That's, that's great, right? Like that shows significant growth. Um, and that one, that starts to make me more interested. Um, if they're collateral that they send me, meaning their pitch, their website media, if, if those things are um, all really professional looking, um, that's, that, that kind of starts to seal the deal a little bit because I don't want to send something that looks amateurish to sure. any of the people that I know that invest because that reflects on me because I don't want them to be like, oh, Janice is an amateur because she just sent me this amateurish looking thing. Yes. Um, she's my time and I don't want to waste people's time, right? And so those are, the, those are the main three things I would say that I'm looking for. In essence, they have to pitch you and convince you yeah, before no you way, refer. Yeah. It really is what yeah. it comes down to. Right. Yep. And it's not the full pitch. You're not going to contact them. And the person you're ref you're referring them to, you know, your contact, I'm sure is going to be really forgiving, but they want you to do a certain amount of homework that this is a pitch that I'd be willing, even if they so say no, if you've helped them do their homework up front, I can see yeah. that sometimes it can be pretty valuable as well. Yeah, totally. And then one more thing to add to this um, is if they if they want me to send a pitch or an intro to someone that I don't actually know at all, like someone sure. that maybe they worked uh, on the opposite side of the world at the same time that I did, and we were both at Uber, and I've never spoken to this person, we just happened to have worked at Uber at the same time, I'm going to tell them like, hey, this is not actually a warm intro. This sure. is not going to be beneficial for you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this. 
when when I'm looking at investment opportunities and I know other investors, especially investors with more dry powder than me, you know, I I I want to refer them good deals. Like I'm always looking for opportunities for my other investment friends because it just helps me and my network out. How are you the same way or are you, do you do it differently? What's your thoughts on that? No, definitely. I'm a, you know, the social capital works in a way where if I give somebody a great deal, I, they think fondly of me, you know, yes. potentially with other investment deals and they're more willing to pass them over. And with angel investing, it is very much about getting access um, to deals that are hot or going to be hot. Um, you compete with, with other investors in a way sometimes. And so you, you want to make sure that people are sending you the best deals that they have pitched to them as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to go through this list here. You provided me this list of criteria that you mm -hmm. look through. And yep. I'm assuming these are in order of priority for you. Um, yeah, actually, yes, these are exactly in order. Okay. And I want to point that out because number five is the pitch deck brand, <laughs> you know, et cetera, which a lot of founders believe if I can make my pitch deck look super fancy and, you know, with animations and things like that, then maybe I'll convince them, but let's get to number five in a moment. Walk us through traction in terms of revenue and or user growth, pretty straightforward, but from your perspective, when you're looking at a deck, how are you evaluating this? Yeah, um, so I look to make sure the numbers make sense that they're putting in there, that they're not fudge at all. Um, I have seen that before where like the calculations didn't quite make sense. Um, you know, they might say our average basket size is this and we have this many users in whatever month. And so I can very easily calculate, uh, you know, the revenue. And if that doesn't match with what else is in there, then I'm like, ah, oh, some something's going on here. And so I'll dig into that. And that's when I I, I lose a little bit of trust. Then um, I also want to see um, significant growth. So I, I said this earlier. I don't want to see two to five percent growth. I want to see very strong early growth. Um, because when you are working with small numbers, when you're working with a few thousand, 10,000 people, um, the, the rate of change should be such that you're like, you're doubling that, you're increasing that by 3x in a year. Uh, and that, that indicates to me that there's going to be a curve uh, very with a really strong slope in terms of growth and opportunity later on. Um, other things, I'm in, in terms of traction, I want to know how they got that traction. Um, so I've seen decks before where all comes from one customer. And that is risky to me. And I don't typically invest in those types of companies because if they turn that client or that client goes out of business, they get a better deal from another competitor or something like that, they're going to lose all of their revenue and have to replace it. So I like to see that their user base um, is diversified a bit. Um, that their revenue is diversified across uh, many different customers and not just like one or two big whales. Okay, let's summarize. I tell founders it needs to point to exponential traction. So that's the reason you set a target, grow 10% a week, because if you can just do that, then every week you're exponentially growing traction. That, that's that hot going towards hockey stick growth. I tell founders revenue is king, but you have to be able to explain that revenue, explain the logic behind the revenue calculations. Now, if it's not revenue, what moves the needle for you in terms of user growth? Like, what do you have to see? Let's say they're not making any money. What do you need to look to see to make a decision? Um, I love to see user research that indicates that um, people do find their differentiators important. Um, maybe they've made a pivot, they've listened to their users and changed something. I like to just see that they're actually talking to the people who will buy the product. Um, downloads are important. Um, I, I would say uh, conversion, uh, I guess if they don't have any revenue at all, uh, they're not going to have conversions from free to paid users. Um, uh, I like to see press coverage. Um, that helps me like start to understand that they they have something 
that is interesting to people at least. Um, other things, potentially web visits um, could be an indicator of, you know, potential future users. People signing up on a wait list is a really big one. Okay. Um, that's, that's a really big one for me. Um, basically anything that's gonna show some kind of indication that people are interested in this, even if they haven't yet paid for it, if there's not something to pay for yet. Um, and that this is something that is uh, well-researched before it was created. Okay, perfect. And what sort of numbers are we talking about? And this is something that obviously is a bit of a moving target, but generally speaking, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, these days, if you have sort of a consumer facing like a B2C type app, you know, a thousand users is not, you know, traction, even if you've gone from like 100 to 500 to 1000 users. Eh, for a consumer facing, especially um, in, in a market where there's loads of density, lots of potential users, et cetera, you need to pretty much be in the tens of thousands, maybe even the hundreds of thousands. True, false, tell me what it is today that sort of um, founders need to say, I've got this type of traction to move the needle with angel investors. Um, I would say you're correct. The, the like 500 users to a thousand, much less interesting than, you know, 10,000 to 30,000 okay. a year. That would be, I'd be like, they're onto something here. Right. Um, and if they can sustain that, if that's, if that's steady growth and there are always going to be a, a couple of wobbles along the way. Right. But if that's for the most part, the trend line is going up and to the right pretty steeply. Um, and they've got thousands tens of thousands of users, uh, at least, least 10,000, I would say, then that's, that's interesting to me. Yes. And I've also seen investors tell founders revenue traction. We appreciate you've got free users, et cetera, but let's say they have a revenue model. They say, we need to see some revenue traction and we need to see X MRR or X ARR before we're interested, come back to us. Walk us through what's the thought process behind it. Why do angels or early stage investors say that? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to churn your customers. There are only so many that you will be able to actually realistically reach. Um, and if people aren't sticking around with your product, if they use it once and they're like, nah, I'm not going to come back, that reduces the lifetime value of the customer. Um, it means the product isn't sticky. It's not useful. It's not solving a really big pain point, really. Um, or if it's something that you buy once and never again, where you, you know, you're not, you're not going to make as much money as if you can get people to keep coming back either to repurchase on like a subscription or add-ons or something like that, or you don't have a diversified enough look at how you're bringing in revenue. Okay. So that's again, de-risking it. And it's like a test. The, the investor wants to know, Hey, can you actually sustain this? Come back. It's not, they're pretty much saying they like the idea, they believe in it. They just want to know that your assumptions are being proven out. You're validating what you're saying. Yep. Okay. So then let's look at the second criteria, strong founding team. We talked about earlier, investors like to invest in founders, not ideas. I always say because founders are the ones that ultimately have to execute. And you said before, and I've seen it, I've seen founders make huge pivots, like completely <laughs> big jumps in a entirely different industries and the investors stick with them. And you would think, oh man, that's just, you know, putting the nail in the coffin there, but the investors believe in them and then they invest more. So how do you evaluate a strong founding team? Strong founding team. Um, have they been successful previously in that they have had some kind of leadership position or a significant role in a company that has done very well in the past. Um, if they have an exit, that's awesome. Um, if they, I, I really want to look for somebody that, that has that like fire, right? Like, are they going to like stick with this? Are they going to get it done? Does the buck stop with them? Um, are they get the kind of person who, when they run into a problem, are they going to be like, I don't know what to do? Or are they going to Google it? Or figure it out or like do what it takes basically to like get past that roadblock. Um, th those are things that I, I want to see. Um, and you can get them from, you know, 
looking at their prior history, their work experience and their progression through that and previous ventures if they have them. You can get that by talking to them personally um, and asking them questions, you know, what is the hardest thing you've ever had to figure out? What have you learned lately? Are you constantly learning or are you stagnant? Because that has implications for the company later on. Um, you know, if you're just satisfied with the, the status quo, um, you can get that by talking to people that know them. Um, you know, like a, a backdoor reference check type of thing. <laughs> people that have managed them before. Um, there are a lot of different ways to get that understanding of like who people are and how you think they're going to perform. Question, how much does mm -hmm. the founder's social media or digital footprint matter to you? Um, I don't want someone who's a jerk. I don't want to invest in someone who's a jerk, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and that's subjective. You know, um, so if I look at somebody's social media and they are posting really unprofessional things, like doing very unprofessional things, I'm like, this is not going to reflect well when they get into a big company type of situation. Mm -hmm. And like, I work, I dealt with scandals, you know, <laughs> like, we, you, you, when you get to that size, like there are going to be like problems and things that you're going to have to overcome in the media and people who are looking for issues to try to like bring you down a little bit and you don't want to just give them ammo for that right up front. Very, very good point. And I tell founders put like pad, not with fluff, but really put some thought leadership articles up on your social media, like have it squeaky clean because you are going to get reference check. You just proved that angel investors do creep your social media. And I, you know, sometimes I'll do this. I'll look at a founder's social media and they're like, I don't use LinkedIn. And I'm, you know, I'm saying, well, you just made you, your job infinitely harder as a founder. Okay. So then what's the advice that you have for founders who don't have that exit, don't have the experience working for, you know, a unicorn or a rocket ship or what have you, what advice would you give to those founders? I'm a one thing that would definitely help is to get board members or advisors or mentors who do have the relevant experience. Because if you can say, you know what, I'm going into this field, let's say I'm going into, let's say it's me, I'm going into CPG. I don't have experience in CPG. I'm it. I do have experience in rapidly growing products and user acquisition in raising funds, leading teams, right? Um, so I have these things and I recognize where I'm deficient. And I found an advisor that worked at PNG in a leadership role for 20 years, something like that. And they've agreed to, to help advise this company. I think that makes a difference for sure. Okay. What if scenario, because I know some mm -hmm. founders like this, they were like, you know, single parents or they were working some retail job, had this great idea. Maybe they've just been a secret closet founder for ages and mm -hmm. suddenly come out, they've got no background and no experience mm -hmm. in the industry, but they have traction. They've actually built something. How much does that traction trump that? Or how much do you still need to see them get advisors and people around them? This is a case by case type of thing, I think. Um, but traction is super important. If they can prove that they can do it, then you've done it, right? Like okay. it doesn't matter what my is because you've done it. Um, and you can always bring on experts, subject matter experts onto your team as you grow. Okay, great. You're hearing it direct, everybody. I love it. All right, potential market size. How do you value, or what does that mean to you? How do you evaluate potential market size? Yeah, um, so potential market size, I, I just want to know, is this something that has a very limited qu potential client base? Like maybe it's a specialized medical device that can only be in research hospitals. Um, that's not as exciting to me. And, and that's just a personal preference, right? Maybe there are however many, a few hundred of them in the United States, I think, maybe a thousand, I'm not sure. Um, I would prefer to invest in something that has the potential to reach millions of people um, because that's, that's just what I'm interested in at this point. Okay, so then <laughs> this is a, a, can be a touchy subject because it's, it's, it can be so frustrating to navigate. Tam Samsung, okay? You know, these, these pitch decks that have Tam Samsung, 
what is Tamsam Som to you? How do you look at it? What advice would you give founders when when creating Tamsam Som? That that slide on their deck. Yeah. So I'm the Tam. So I wanna I wanna understand what is the total market size, right? Like what what is the high in the sky, like the biggest potential market size, um, because that gives me a sense of just overall scale. Do I think more competitors are going to come in the space if there aren't a lot of them, that kind of thing, right? Um, but then I want the I want the founder to be realistic about what they think they can get. Uh, if I if somebody comes in and says, okay, to make this business work, we're going to need twenty percent of the market share within you know five years. That's unrealistic, and that makes me start to doubt that they know what they're doing or that they that they're going to be able to like hit the goals required to hit like profitability goals which eventually mean that I get money back right um so I want to see that they like they they actually understand like what is something reasonable do they do they have kind of a plan of attack for how they're going to get whatever percentage of the total overall market um that they say they're going to go after okay i tell founders so <laughs> As an investor, when I'm initially evaluating, I'm going to get a general idea of TAM. Does it make sense? Are there really that many of these types of users? They got to give me something. But then when it gets to SAMS and SOM, I don't have the expertise to calculate that, but I know enough that I can see if something's not realistic, which is what you pretty much explain. And so if they're saying, you know, our TAM is $10 billion and we believe in the SOM where, you know, we can uh, serviceable, uh, obtainable market, we can obtain 10% of that. They better have a really good plan and have really good proof. And so we don't know if the founder is right from an exact number perspective, but we know enough to smell BS and if they're just faking it, how yep. is that for you? Same thing. Yeah, you sum up my words perfectly, Ed. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's great. So hence, so let me ask you this question. How important is it for the founder to indicate and show their math and their logic when Tam Sam song? Um, I would hmm. It's not necessarily if it makes sense, if it's if it looks reasonable based on what I know about the market. And that, again, this is why I invest in companies in either areas or types of companies that I'm somewhat familiar with so that I can I can look at it and say, yeah, that seems reasonable. If it seems reasonable, I'm not going to cry. Mm -hmm. If it seems if there's a question or if it seems like wildly unreasonable, then I'm going to be like, I, how did you get this? Like, okay. where did this? Great. And same advice. I say, just be ready to show your math. It's going to be important. Okay. Um, let's take a side question for a moment here. Let's talk about the different pitch decks. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, typically we say there's a screener deck. There's the pitch deck that you send in your outreach. And then there's the pitch deck that you're going to present with because they probably, you know, you probably looked at the deck and you said, I'm ready for the next meeting and uh, I'd like some more information so you can go a little more in depth. Walk us through like what, what are the different pitch decks that you've seen or what would you prefer to see in terms of the first outreach deck to the deck when you're sitting down with them and saying, hey, let's walk through, I have questions, et cetera. Yeah, I would say give me the just the highlights. Like, give me the appetizer first. Uh, make me hungry. You know, like <laughs> um, I, I want to see. I'm um, basically like in a very concise, like very clear way. Like, here's the traction. Here's the team and why you should care. Here's the problem and how we're solving it. And here's how big the problem is, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And like, here's to learn more. It doesn't have to be long. Um, and from there, I, I'll make a pretty quick judgment. Like this is something I'm interested in learning more about or it's something I'm not. Um, and if I am, that's when I want to start to see like, okay, like what are the projections here? I'm on a kind of a longer term basis. How did they get there? Like, what is the money going to be used for? What are the, the details of, of the investment? That kind of thing. Yeah, founders get so angsty and they think, oh, they're going to miss all this. 
let me ask you this question. You know, some founders like just pile so much information into that first deck. What type of effect does that have when you get like a 30 page deck right off the bat? I don't, I, I don't read it. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> yeah. Like literally how long does it take you to disqualify that type of deck or a deck that you just absolutely know right from like, Sometimes I, I can get it right from the cover page, right? Like how long does it take for you to say, okay, you know, this might be the greatest idea in the world, but I'm not even going to go there. How long does it take? Five minutes, maybe. I scroll through very quickly to see if I can get what I need to get out of it. And then if it seems interesting, if things are standing out, it looks professional. I'll go through in a little more detail and then get the, the longer pitch deck or the details. Okay. How many times have you said, I'm not even going to open the deck based on the intro email. What? <laughs> Very good, guys. Uh, if, it's, if it is rude, which I've had people be very rude, like in the opening emails before, surprisingly, um, you know, I'm going to get this money with or without you. So you need to like, you need to look at this. I'm like, do I really need to do that? Um, no. That, that's what Are you serious? Very few people. Very few people do that. Sure. But it doesn't. Um, if they spell my name wrong, that's a big Ooh. pet peeve. Of <laughs> Which is maybe petty, but it says that they're like, they're not paying attention to what they're doing, basically. Like, my name is right there on my LinkedIn. It's right there when you message me. Like, just take a look and read what you're sending. And then if the, if I can't make sense of what they're saying, if, you know, it's very like disjointed and doesn't flow well. That doesn't give me confidence that they're going to be able to reach out to other investors, get clients, that kind of thing. Wow. And how many, how many queries do you get a day? 20 to 30, probably 20 to 30 a day. And again, explain to founders, think about it. Like what you have to screen through and all the noise that comes your way, you're just looking for a, one type of signal, either qualify or disqualify. So I think you're being very generous giving a deck five minutes. I understand how you can just disqualify someone from the email, but um, I'm, I'm way harsher. So you're a lot more generous than I am. So thank you for being that way. Um, let's take a look at for in an area of interest um, or experience. Uh, there's a typo there. In an area of interest or experience, for you, what does that mean? How do you decide that? Yeah, so um, that's two buckets here. So if I have experience like in a marketplace type of business and um, technology, that kind of thing, I, I can evaluate what they're saying and I don't have to do as much research on like competitors and um, the numbers and things like that. Um, it's easier for me because I've, I've done things um, in that field before and I can identify with it and say, yes, this makes sense. No, this doesn't make sense. This is a good opportunity, whatever. Um, in the other bucket, if I'm interested in something, then it's something I want to learn more about. Something that is um, like I'm interested in emerging markets. I'm interested in biotech. Um, I'd love to learn more about crypto. I don't know very much about it. Um, blockchain, that kind of thing. Um, that I, I feel like investing in those companies gives me a reason to like set aside the time and start learning about them, read the investor updates and get more familiar. And so it's almost like taking a class in a way. And so either of those, I, if, if a company falls into either of those buckets, then it becomes more interesting to me. How would I research if I, and how possible is it? Because we know you can get lists and, you know, angels and firms will say, we want to invest in this space type thing. We write checks of this size and they'll give the parameters just so that you can say, hey, I might be barking up the wrong tree, but how are some other ways that I can research? Say I want to approach you, Janisa, that um, I actually giving you something you'd be interested in not wasting your time and wasting my time. Yeah, um, so you can look at my angel list. I'm in other investors angel list and it shows what we've invested in there. Um, and you can research those companies and get a sense for what people have done. Um, you can take a look at many investors' social media. You can creep back and, exactly. oh, they're posting something. Uh, they must be interested in that. Or they're, they're posting about learning about something. They're asking questions, whatever it may be, right? 
you can see what people have liked on LinkedIn, like different posts. Uh, that's going kind of deep in the creep, but <laughs> you, you know, you can see what they've liked and, and that indicates that they're interested in it. You can look at where they've worked before. Um, a lot of people, you know, what they worked on before, the field that they worked in the industry, that kind of guides the way that they're investing. Um, you can just ask them. Yes. Oh, good idea. Yeah. My response is not, but you can always ask. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I tell founders that if the investor you want to approach does not have social media, then you should probably be weary of that unless you can find a real personal contact that can establish and there's a reason. But most investors, I would say like the dominant majority of investors are pretty active on social media for this very reason. How does that concur with your experience? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then let's get to the final. Let's talk about professionalism, materials, pitch deck, brand, et cetera. We talked about how this is at the bottom of your list. The top is traction. As we said, if, if you're looking and, oh my gosh, look at this you know, growth graph right off the bat. I tell founders, if you have that, lead with that. Like we're growing. This is what we do and we're growing X percent or this is how much we've grown. But beyond that, what does it mean for professionalism, materials, pitch deck, brand, et cetera? What are you looking for? Yeah, um, so I want to make sure that they can present their company in a way that makes sense, um, in a way that leads me to believe that they'll be able to do sales, you know, that they'll be able to get clients, um, that they care about their brand, um, that it's not disjointed and like difficult to understand like what they're even doing because if they're trying to pitch me to give them money um, and the materials they're providing make it difficult for me to even understand like what they're doing or or how they want to be perceived or like who they're going after potential clients or users are not going to be able to understand that either and it'll prevent them from getting revenue which means I won't get my money back later on mm. uh, that being said if you I'm not a designer like I'm a bad designer um, I, I just hire people on um, like Upwork um, or I hire designer friends um, to either look at what I put together when I do decks and websites and things like that and help me make adjustments or to just do it based on like, here's the content I need to get across. Can you make this look nice? So how much should I be spending on designing my deck and my brand and everything like that at seed stage? Okay, so we're past pre-seed, seed stage. How much should I be investing in that? And you don't need to invest a ton. Okay. Um, a, under a thousand dollars for for sure. I would say a thousand or lower, depending on how much you have to do and where you are with the, the basics of it. Um, maybe it, if you have a lot of work to do, if you need your whole pitch deck done. If you need help with the content, that kind of thing, maybe a couple thousand dollars. Um, but if you just need someone to make your PowerPoint look nice and you already have the content and it's perfect, then you can hire someone um, for 10, 15, $20 an hour on Upwork or something like that to make it look nice. So sure. that depends on what you need exactly. Yeah. And so I, this is, that was a very vague and ambiguous question. No, and it was at, it, I I asked it on purpose that way to just give some general ideas because you recognize that you're not a designer, so you're going to spend the money. You don't need to go to an agency at this stage. An agency doesn't need to build your brand and all this stuff, even though the agency will tell you later yes. on. You're going like let's say once you get you know a round past the a round really putting polish and making sure your brand is tight is going to be important for you to grow. But in the beginning stage, I would say me as an investor, I'm going to look at what's appropriate. For example, if you're in CPG and you've got really horrible packaging, well, that's going to affect, and that says something about you as a founder. But if you're in B2B SaaS, you don't need this amazing thing. And you're telling me that you've got these big clients that are using you and it's, it's just not as pertinent in the beginning. I'm not expecting everything to look really polished, professional, but not so polished that it looks like you went to an agency 
on Madison Avenue. What do you think about yes. that approach? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, I, I don't really care about like the, this is why we chose this color because it represents whatever. And here's why we chose this font. Like pick a font, pick a couple of colors. You can always change it later. Um, you just need something that looks professional yes. initially. And so my advice is, and I'm curious what you think about this. I've actually said, I've talked to designers about this and it's tough to get designers actually to jump on board because they want to do like agency level stuff and they have a portfolio. But I said, you know, what if we could help founders with a pre-seed brand, a seed brand, a, you know, round brand, and then above, right? And you can iterate and show that over the course of time. And so maybe at a pre-seed, we're not talking about that now, but for those who are interested pre-seed, your brand can be just a really nice logo with a really nice font and, you know, pick some nice typography, et cetera. And then when you're at seed stage, well, yeah, invest a little more and let your brand evolve with your startup. What do you think? Yeah, totally. You can get a logo for 50 bucks. Yes. Um, I, I made my logo for one of my business in Canva for free when I first started one of my businesses. And, and nobody's ever asked. They're like, they don't care about the logo. It looks yeah. deep. They care about what I'm actually doing. Yes. So. Okay. So your the your materials, that professionalism really is a reflection of your professionalism as a founder. And that's what's important here. Yes. All right. So, okay. This was amazing. Thank you for providing insight, being transparent. Not all investors are willing to sit down and have these types of conversation uh, because well, one, they don't want to get hit up with everybody, but it's, you know, part of the game. What final advice would you give for people who, founders who are there and they say, I want to go for a seed round. How do they prepare? How would you go about it? What coaching would you give them? Yeah, um, I would say make sure you're, um, you're professional uh, in your public facing materials so that people, when they Google you, they can find you looks um you know good enough so that they have confidence you can make a sale get those traction numbers down um make sure you're showing clear continuous growth i am at a steep level um i would say do your research on potential investors um who you're going to reach out to why you're reaching out to them how you're going to reach out set some follow-ups as well because um i i do get so much outreach that it, it's helpful if someone does follow up um, because I might forget, honestly, um, to, to go back and find them again later. Um, and I would say, uh, I think that's it. Those are okay. the four things I would go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then I just thought of a bonus question. So yeah, if you'd be willing to share what, what's, what was the best outreach email you ever got or outreach yeah. contact that made you go, I need to, you know, click on this deck and this link, et cetera. You don't have to be specific, but what, like, what was the experience like? What'd they do? You know, there was actually someone who sent me a custom video. Like oh, interesting. He, he, he had recorded it. Um, it was, said my name, said my name correctly, actually, which is most people don't do that. Um, so that was like, a, like, Hey, Janisa, like, I see that you have done X, Y, Z and I'm, um, you know, I got referred to you from whoever. I, here's what I'm doing. And this is why I think you'll like it. And then like, just very quickly listed a 30 second video, maybe 60 seconds, but it was cool. It was different. Oh, so it got your attention. How was it sent by email, LinkedIn? Like what was the medium? I think it was LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. I think, yeah. So you're okay with getting multimedia, like video messages. Yeah. Yeah. It was different from the typical message. So it, that's why it caught my eye and I watched it and I clicked into things and, and looked at it. Okay. So then now what about the traditional? So like just a standard in mail message or email, what was the best one you ever got? That's so hard to answer. Um, I, I don't have one off the top of my head, but I know there have been a couple that um, they, they did their research, but they also like, they had a funny like opening line that made me click on it. I don't remember what it was. But it was um, different. Yeah, I it, it, they used humor, basically. They made, they made a joke. It was very self-aware. 
um, about like, I think it was like about me getting a bunch of outreach and like, you know, I'm not going to waste your time, but if I do like, you know, you can just delete this email or like something like that. It was funny. Humor is not going to work with everybody. Sure. People have different humor, but like, it was funny to me. And I was like, okay, I'll read this. I think you just have proven researching your investors is so important right? Because, yeah. because you, you know, you're kind of the, the next generation. You're not some, you know, 70 year old sitting in, you know, you've exited and you're sitting on your billions and decide to be an angel investor. Like you are an active, you said operator angel. So know your investor. And yeah, if you, if you meet and, you know, Janice, you're, you're pretty rare in terms of how far you've come. It's a total testament to your success and you're angel investing already. And a lot of, you see a lot of founders go into angel investing after exiting startup and they're on YouTube and all these things. You can approach them differently. Like if they're on TikTok, you know, they yeah. probably, you can probably approach them differently than if they're working at some, you know, family office that's gone like generations, right? And, you know, they're in their 50s or 60s. So research your investor, not all investors are the same. And then go through, Everything that Janissa talked about, traction, 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 get it right, communicate it professionally. I think we're good. How does that sound, Janissa? Yeah, that's great. Okay, once again, thank you so much. And if someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Um, you can message me on LinkedIn. Um, or if you want to email me, you can email me at Janissa at jjstudio.app. Okay. And thankfully, Janice is part of the startups.com ecosystem. So she's willing to help all our founders. We're very fortunate to have her. This is not going to be the last time we're going to be having a conversation for everybody. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to sharing this out there and getting everybody's reaction. Thanks again, Janice. Thanks, Ed.